ثم أما بعد. I'd like to start today by wrapping up some things from section six in your notes that is on page fourteen, and inshallah ta'ala thereafter I'm going to I don't know how I'm going to do this. It's, I think it's considered mission impossible today. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take shorter breaks today, okay? Because I can't afford to give you too much time off today. So eat fast. And you know, pray slowly. I can't tell you to pray fast, but pray slowly, but eat fast and no hour break for, for lunch today. Sorry. We're going we're gonna to wrap up whatever we're going to eat and pray in 30 minutes and be back. Because I just don't have enough time to cover the stuff I really, really, really want to cover with you. And I will be seriously depressed if I didn't get to finish the things that I wanted to share with you, inshallah. Okay? So, let's get this started. In section 6, I, I want to give you an introduction a little bit again. Uh, before we get to the macro side, this is the last piece of the micro side of things. Uh, the idea of sequencing something in your speech, okay? Uh, as I'm speaking to you, sometimes I mention two things in my sentence. I say something like, you know, the days and nights that I spent in va on vacation, etc., etc. So I mentioned days and then I mentioned nights. I ordered these two words in my head a certain way. Was I conscious of it? Not really. I just said it, it just came in my head and I said it. I could have maybe in another conversation, I could have said the nights and days that I spent there were awesome. In other words, I say day and nights and subconsciously sometimes I say nights and days and I don't really think about that sort of thing because people when they speak, human beings when we speak, uh, there are conscious parts of our speech and there are also subconscious parts of our speech and we're not really in control all the time of the subconscious parts of our speech, right? So if you're used to saying things a certain way, you always say them the same way. So if you're used to saying boys and girls, subconsciously you always say what? Boys and girls. You almost never say girls and boys. And actually when you say girls and boys, you have to consciously think about it. So what happens in our heads, this is kind of like speech pathology and linguistics combined a little bit. In our conscience, <coughs> we get used to saying things a certain way. And that just becomes the natural way for us to communicate. So if you like putting something first and something second, it's just the way you do it. Now the interesting thing is that the Qur'an, from a linguistics perspective, is really remarkable because Allah breaks these patterns all the time. He doesn't stick to one way of saying something. Like for example, he doesn't just say, Wallahu bima ta'maluna khabir. And every time he says, Wallahu bima ta'maluna khabir. And Wallahu bima ta'maluna khabir. Sometimes he says, Wallahu khabirun bima ta'malun. Wallahu khabirun bima ta'malun. He changes it. Now for a normal human being who's used to saying something repeatedly, they would, fit, they would say it one way and they would stick to that one way and they'll never change it. It would just not be possible for them. But Allah Azza wa Jal changes it over and over and over again on multiple occasions. And sometimes He changes it so quickly that actually human beings in our natural speech, we can't even keep up. We can't do that so rapidly in our speech the way Allah does that in His speech. So I'm going to give you some examples of how that is so incredible in the Qur'an. Something that we consciously, human beings consciously are incapable of doing. We're just incapable of it. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, قُلْ هُوَ الرَّحْمَانُ آمَنَّا بِهِ وَعَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْنَا This is an ayah from Surah Al-Mulk. This is on page 14 in that first section. I'm zooming in on it here. You guys can see it now, right? قُلْ هُوَ الرَّحْمَانُ Say he is الرَّحْمَانُ آمَنَّا بِهِ We have believed in him. We've believed in him. وَعَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْنَا And upon him we rely. Now I want you to look at this carefully. We believe in him. Upon him we rely. There's actually a strange rearrangement. If you have a certain speech pattern, you say, We believe in him. We rely upon him. Isn't that how you would say it? But one part of the statement was in normal ordering, we believe in Him. The other part of the statement, immediately Allah switched over and said, instead of saying we rely upon Him, which is not said in the Qur'an, what is said is, upon Him we rely. Upon Him we rely. I immediate switch. Now these kinds of changes in sequence inside of a sentence, they have a reason. If you go back a little bit, a couple of days ago when we were much younger on Friday night, I told you about normal order and strange order. You remember that? 
and normal order and strange order. For those of you that are students of the Arabic language, this is the, the subject matter of at-taqdeem wa ta'khir. Right? And there are four benefits of this thing in Balagha studies and all of that, but I'm not giving you that technical lesson. What I did tell you on Friday night was, when you use the unusual order, then what you are adding to the discussion is the word only. Remember, hamd only belongs to Allah, as opposed to hamd belongs to Allah, right? So what, what Allah is saying then here is, we believe in Him, we believe in Him, but we only rely upon Him. So the second statement actually has an only, and where did the only come from? From the unusual sequencing. You guys with me so far? Now that's incredible. That's actually incredible. Why? Because we believe in Allah, but we don't only believe in Allah. We believe in Allah, we believe in the prophets, we believe in the angels, we believe in the day of judgment, we believe in the books, we believe in predestination, we believe in Jannah, we believe in Jahannam, we believe in Yawmul Qiyamah, we believe in lots of things. We don't just believe in one thing. Saying we only believe in Allah would be a problem. Sequencing it as bihi amanna would be a problem. But when it comes to relying on someone, do we rely on the angels? Do we rely on the creation of Allah? Do we rely on Jahannam or Jannah? What do we, who do we rely on only and exclusively? Allah. Tawakkul is only a matter of between us and Allah. So he switches the order immediately and makes it exclusive immediately. Only upon Him do we place our trust. And this happens in a split second. That's the incredible thing. You know, we're talking about speech that happens. For us, this will take me 10 minutes to explain, by the way. And I, at the very least, I would have to add the, add, add the word only. And by the way, I wouldn't even add the word only. Now, normally we say, English translations say, well, you know, say He is Ar-Rahman, say, he, say He's the most merciful, we believe in Him and we rely upon Him. That's how it's translated. Wait, wait, wait. There's a problem there. We only rely upon Him. Like even when we're writing down a translation, which is different from speaking, because when you're writing, you can take your time and edit your words and think them through, even then we don't think of it. <laughs> and here Allah is saying it so accurately, just in speech, just split second. I want you to be aware of this reality as we go through this section. When human beings speak, they make mistakes. It is inevitable. I spoke to you for oh, I don't know how many hours yesterday. And as I was speaking to you, I am sure I made tons of grammatical mistakes. I am absolutely certain that I repeated myself several times. And as I repeat myself, it is actually considered a kind of mistake. In other words, if you took a transcript of my speech, and you went through it, there would be times I would mispronounce something, there would be times where I would misspeak, there would be times where I would omit something that I should have said, there would be times that I'd say the same sentence two or three times. You don't write like that. You don't write an email like that. You don't write an essay like that. You don't write an article like that because you get rid of all the omissions. You get rid of all the mistakes. You get rid of all the repetitions because you go through an editorial process. When you hand in, some of you when you go to school, you go to college or university, you have an essay assignment. And you hand in the professor. Some professors are very merciful. They ask you for the first draft. Version 1. So you give it to them and they destroy it and then say, bring me back the real version now. Right? Give me, give me the second draft. And do you write your essay one time and that's it? You don't even look back or do you go for spell checking and correcting and taking out sentences and moving paragraphs? Do you do this? You have to do what is called an editorial process. As a matter of fact, not just you, your college students, therefore you're terrible at writing, but other people. Like authors, people who write actual books. Even they write a book and then they come out with second edition, third edition, fourth edition. In the intro to the book, in the preface they say, I'd like to thank my friends who told me to get rid of that chapter because it was really stupid. And I'd like to thank my mother who told me I'm a loser. And all of these things. Like they, they write those things in the preface because there is such a thing as an editorial process. The incredible thing about the Qur'an is that it wasn't given to humanity in the form of a book. It was given to humanity in the form of speech. In the form of speech. And the problem with speech is, once it leaves your words, you can no longer edit them. When you write something on paper, you can actually cross it out, you can edit it. When you're typing something up, until you hit send, you can still go back and erase. You can still change. 
there is an editor, there's an opportunity for you to edit. But the Quran, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would say it, and you don't, he doesn't get to say it and say, wait, let me, let me say that better, hold on, let me just give you a better version. No. You say it once, and that is the final version, the version we're still reciting now. The version that we're still reciting now. And for that first version to be perfect, is humanly impossible. That is human, that's the point we're trying to explore here. Why is this speech impossible in my belief and your belief? Why is it impossible to replicate? Just purely from a linguistics perspective, from speech pathology perspective. Now look at this. Allah Azza wa says, let's see, give you a, because I want to go through this one rather quickly. I'll give you this, the really hard ones. The ones that are harder to understand, I want to do them with you, inshallah. Um, all right. Let's look at this one. Allah says in Surah Al-Kahf, Absir bihi wa asmi'. This is on the next page, on page 15. Surah Al-Kahf, right towards the middle. Absir bihi wa asmi'. Ma lahum min dunihi min wali, wa la yushriku fi hukmihi ahada. Absir, or absara, or basira. Anyone know what that means? What it has to do with? It has to do with seeing. Wa asmi'. Fam sami'a, yasma'u sam'an. Anyone? Hearing. So it has to do with seeing and hearing. And roughly translated, the ayah means absir bihi wa asmi' how well he sees and how well he hears. How well he sees and how well he hears. It's talking about Allah. Now what's peculiar about this is that actually in the rest of the Quran, consistently, Allah actually mentions seeing first and hearing second. The speech pattern of the Qur'an is not to mention seeing first. The speech pattern of the Qur'an is what is mentioned first? Hearing first, and seeing is mentioned second. For instance, when Allah talks about the creation of the human being, Allah says, وَجَعَلْنَاهُ سَمِيعًا basira." Okay? We made him able to see, or able to hear, able to see. So hearing is mentioned before seeing. And this is consistent across the Qur'an. Even Allah's names, as Sami' al-Basir. Which one will you find first? Will you find al-Basir al-Sami' or al-Sami' al-Basir? Al-Sami' al-Basir. So Allah, the hearing, the seeing. So hearing is consistently mentioned first. There are only two exceptions to this. Of the dozens of examples, where hearing always comes first, two times the pattern is broken. And you would think, why would the pattern break? The two times, this is one of them, Absir bihi wa asmi' And the one underneath it is the second one. You see towards the end, Absarna wa sami'na. Absarna wa sami'na. Which means we see and we hear. Instead of saying what? We hear and we see. It's reversed. So the question becomes, why change the sequence unusually in this case? In the first case, it's talking about the people of the cave. These young men went and hid away from their village and their city. They went hiding inside of a cave. And when they went hiding inside of a cave, the problem wasn't that nobody could hear them. The real problem was that nobody could find them. Nobody could see them. Nobody could see them. And so in that context, what Allah wanted to highlight first and foremost was, nobody knew where they were, but how well Allah sees. You understand? There's a reason to highlight that first. Additionally, first of all, you don't even know where they are. But Allah, not only does He have full view of what's going on inside the darkness of a cave, He also has complete details, the smallest details, of the most intimate conversations that are happening among friends inside of this cave. There is no microphone there, there is no camera there, there is no journalist there taking notes, they are not transcribing their conversation, there is no historical record of what happened inside the cave, except the only witness there is Allah. And He's recording this conversation. Which leads me to another point on the side. The Qur'an has its unique perspective on history, because usually when you read a book of history, you get the perspective of an author. You get the perspective of a researcher. You get the perspective of someone who've got, who's gone through the accounts of other people. When you're reading the Qur'an and you're reading history, who is the actual historian? Allah Himself. You're getting Allah's perspective on history in the Qur'an. Not a historian perspective. Not a scholar's perspective. Not a human perspective. It's remarkable. And when a historian writes his history, 
I'm still on that side note because it's important. When a historian writes history, he mentions the details that he thinks are important. Okay, so he'll mention the army was made up of approximately 3,000 soldiers. They traveled from north to south. They traveled for three months. The battle went on for four years. Whatever, whatever. He'll mention the big details. You're not going to find a historian that is going to say, and by the way, there was a conversation that happened between two soldiers over lunch. Here's what it was. You're not going to find it. Why? Because the historian says that is not an important detail. I need to give you the overall picture. You understand? They, don't, they skip the details. And they don't even have access to those details. Who's going to record a conversation between two guys over lunch? And then you look at the Qur'an. And these young men are sleeping. And then they wake up. And they wake up and they say, Hey man, how long were you sleeping? And the other one says, uh, I think يَوْمًا وَبَعْضَ يَوْمًا I think it was a day. No, 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 it wasn't a whole day. No, 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 that's crazy. The sun's still out. Uh, it must have been an hour. بعض يوم, some part of a day. I think we had a power nap. <laughs> and the other guy, another guy says, Man, who cares day, part of a day? I'm hungry. Dude, forget about Allah knows better, okay? Who cares about this conversation? We need to eat. Let's go, let's collect money. How much you got, how much you got, how much you got? Give it to this guy, because this guy knows all the restaurants. <laughs> he knows the good spots to eat. You go out and get us food, bro. What, you want me to go back into the village? They're looking for us in the village. They're gonna arrest us. Just watch out, just watch out, just be careful, okay? And don't act all like, just act normal. Okay? وَلْيَتَلَطَّفْ <laughs> Quran says, وَلْيَتَلَطَّفْ just, just be chill, dude. Just take it easy. So when you go into the city, just take it easy. And don't let anybody know what you're really up to. Don't order like 15 bags of food. One guy's walking around like 15 bags of food. Like, where's this guy going with all that food? You know? Well, I was hungry, you know? <laughs> this really, it seems like a really casual conversation. Would you find a conversation like this in a history book? No. And even if you did, it would be a conversation between a king and his minister, or between you know, an ambassador, or somebody important in some public setting where there are scribes and historians that are writing things down. This conversation is happening inside of a cave. How well Allah sees, and how well Allah hears. You appreciate the perspective on this now? What Allah is saying here? It's, it's remarkable really. The other place that this is mentioned is also incredible. It's incredible. Allah says, وَلَوْ تَرَى إِذِ الْمُجْرِمُونَ نَاكِسُوا رُؤُوسِهِمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ If you could only see the time when criminals are going to be holding their heads down before their master in humility, meaning the day of judgment, and people are embarrassed and humiliated, and they can't even lift their head before Allah, and they turn to Allah and they say, رَبَّنَا أَبْصَرْنَا وَسَمِعْنَا Ya Allah, we've seen enough. Okay, okay, I believe now. I see it, I see it. I see وَبُرْ رِزَةِ الْجَحِيمُ لِمَنْ يَرَى Hellfire is brought forward for, the, for whoever to see. Now these people are for, and they don't want to see it by the way. Their heads are held back. Look at it, look at it, look at it. And they say, okay, okay, we see, we see, we see, okay. I'm ready to listen now. So he says, I see, and therefore I am ready to listen. But the entire point of the message of Islam for all of the Prophets was, the Prophets are asking for you to listen, for you to listen. And the people said, no, we don't want to listen, we want to see. That's, that wasn't that the problem? Every Prophet said, please listen to me, please listen to me. The believers who listened to the Prophet said, سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا إِنَّنَا سَمِعْنَا مُنَادِيًا يُنَادِي لِلْإِيمَانِ Not إِنَّنَا أَبْصَرْنَا مُنَادِيًا إِنَّنَا سَمِعْنَا مُنَادِيًا We heard the call of a caller calling to Iman. The Prophets are saying, please listen to what I'm saying. You know? No, 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 we don't want to listen. We don't want to listen. If you really want to impress us, don't impress us with your words. How about you show us an angel? Let's see it. So an angel talks to you? I don't see an angel. Can you uh, demonstrate this angel for me, please? Oh, so you get a book? Let's see the pages. Let me see the pages floating down from the sky. Then I'll believe you. Oh, you want to talk about Allah? Let's see Him. Oh, you, you're talking about some punishment that's going to come? Fire's gonna rain from the sky? There's gonna be an earthquake? There's gonna be a flood? 
uh, yeah, I've heard that enough. Let's see it. وَيَسْتَعْجِلُونَكَ بِالْعَذَابِ In other words, the entire problem of the disbeliever was, I am not interested in hearing, I am only interested in seeing. On judgment day, exactly as per his request, what does Allah make him do? See, and he says, okay, okay, I see, I'm ready to listen. That's why that's mentioned. Meaning in dunya, it's about listening. And in akhirah, it's about seeing. In dunya, you listen and come to your faith. In this world, you come to li you listen and you reach faith. And in the afterlife, it is you see, and then nobody disbelieves in the afterlife. Everybody's a believer because they've seen now. Okay, now I'm gonna move along, inshallah. Again, I'm gonna be selective today in what I think are the, the most powerful examples that I can illustrate in short amounts of time. This one is pretty awesome. Let's do وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ مِنْ إِمْلَاقِ I'm gonna first ask you to understand the difference between the following two sentences. I eat because of hunger. I eat out of fear of hunger. Is there a difference between these two eaters? Two people are at a restaurant. They're about to chew into a burger. You ask one of them, why are you eating? He says, because I'm hungry. You ask the second guy, why are you eating? He says, I'm afraid of being hungry. Are they eating for the same reason? No. What's the difference? The one who's hungry is actually already experiencing hunger. The one who says, I am afraid of hunger. Is he actually experiencing hunger? No, he's actually full, he's still eating. You understand? Fear is associated not with what is happening to you right now. Fear is associated with what is going to happen to you. You're not afraid of what already happened or what is happening. You're actually afraid of what is going to happen. People get afraid of a loud sound, not because they are hurt right now, but it might hurt them. People are afraid of the news of a storm or a tornado or an earthquake coming or something. Not because of what has already happened, but what is going to happen. You understand? But when you say that I'm doing something because of something, because, then the reason already exists. And the reason already exists. Okay. Now go to the ayat. لا ولا تقتلوا أولادكم. Do not kill your children. Allah says, do not kill your children. He says this twice. He says this in Surah Al-Isra and in Surah Al-An'am. He says, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ Do not kill your children. The children here are very relieved. Whew! Do not kill your children. You can use this, by the way, children, when you do really poor on your exams in school, and you come home with a terrible report card, you can just say, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ Don't recite the rest of the ayah, just say that part and run. Okay. So, <laughs> so وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ Do not kill your children. Then it says, min imlaq. I will translate that as roughly as a, because of bankruptcy. Do not kill your children because of bankruptcy. And nahnu narzukukum wa iyahum. We are in fact the ones who provide you and we also provide them. So who's you and who's them? Can somebody explain that to me? Who's you? The parents. Very good. And who's them? The children. Let's go over that really quickly again. Do not kill your children because of bankruptcy. We're the ones who provide you, and we're the ones who provide them. Okay, look at the next ayah. وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ خَشْيَةَ إِمْلَاقٍ Do not kill your children out of fear of bankruptcy. We're the, we're, the, we're the ones who provide them and you. Last time he said, we provide you and them. This time he says, we provide them and you. How come the change in sequence? You see, in the first case, Allah did not say, don't kill them out of fear of bankruptcy. He said, don't kill them because of bankruptcy. And if, when He says, don't kill them because of bankruptcy, that means the bankruptcy already exists. You're already poor. You already have nothing. And when you have nothing, then you are hungry. Your children are additionally hungry, but primarily and first and foremost, you yourself are hungry. And so Allah says, I'll provide you. And them. Because you are already what? Hungry. When Allah says, don't kill your children because you're afraid of bankruptcy. Look, if somebody is afraid of bankruptcy, are they hungry yet or are they afraid of being hungry? 
which means they're not hungry right now. And they're thinking that if they start paying for the bills and the medical bills and the food and the diapers and the, sorry, pampers and the nappies, nappies. We saw that at the airport, nappy changing room or nappy room. Because, you know, we say nappy when you want to take a nap. <laughs> that would be a really confusing situation at the airport. I'm going to go to the nappy room. and <laughs> you find something. <laughs> These people have no idea how to take a nap. Anyway, so <laughs> but anyway, look, you've got all these expenses associated with the children, and you're thinking the moment you have a child, things are going to become so expensive, you're not going to be able to afford anything anymore, you will go bankrupt. Allah says, don't worry, you're not the one who has to pay for them. I'll pay for them. Nahnu narzuku home, we'll pay for them, we'll provide them, and by the way, I won't just provide for them, we'll also take care of... You. See, the you and them, and the them and you is a profound lesson. That took me about 10-15 minutes to explain. But Allah did that just by switching the words. And what's even more remarkable is that these two ayat belong to two different surahs. Which means they were revealed at two very different occasions. And it's not like the Prophet ﷺ has a piece of paper in front of him that says the similar ayah over here. Let me just compare. Okay, Because... You, them. Okay, so this is fear of, so maybe it should be them, you. Okay, let me just move this. It happens one time. He says it. That's it. It's given to him. It's the final version. That's, we just think about how impossible that is. <laughs> just think about how impossible that is. Look at this. This example actually blows my mind. It just absolutely blows my mind. خَتَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ You know the famous ayah, Baqarah? خَتَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَعَلَىٰ سَمِعِهِمْ وَعَلَىٰ أَبْصَارِهِمْ غِشَاوَةً Allah says that Allah placed a seal upon their hearts and He placed a seal upon their hearing. And the ayah goes on, but I'll just focus on these two things for now. Allah placed a seal upon their hearts and their hearing. Okay. Hearts and hearing. But when you go to Surah Al-Jathiyah, Allah says, وَخَتَمَ عَلَىٰ سَمِعِهِ وَقَلْبِهِ he placed a seal upon his hearing and his heart. He placed a seal upon his hearing and his heart. And I'm thinking, wait, Baqarah said that the heart was sealed first and the hearing was sealed second. Jathia, surah number 45 says, the hearing was sealed first and the heart was sealed second. Is there even a purpose for this kind of change? This is where the, the conscious human speech is, is impossible. As a matter of fact, conscious human literature and writing isn't even capable of this. Think about this. Surah Al-Baqarah. One of the first ayat. Anybody know them by heart? Alif Lam Mim what? ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ That's the book in which there is absolutely no doubt whatsoever. Doubt is a problem of the heart. هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ It is guidance. Guidance happens where? The heart. وَمَنْ يُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ يَهْدِي قَلْبَهُ Guidance happens in the heart. Hudal lil muttaqin. It is guidance for who? People who have taqwa, consciousness of Allah. The consciousness of Allah is where? It's in the heart. Because Allah says, Inna dhalika min taqwa al qulub. Taqwa is in the heart. Al ladina yu'minuna bil ghayb. They believe in the unseen. Where is iman? Where is faith? Where does it rest? Inside the heart. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, Walakin Allah habbaba ilaykum al iman wa zayyanahu fi qulubikum. Iman is inside the heart. Everything that is mentioned in the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah from doubt to guidance to taqwa to belief has to do with what? The common thing that ties all of those things together, the common element is the heart. Then Allah switches over to the disbelievers. The disbelievers, kufr. Kufr is where? The heart. Disbelief is in the heart. Then Allah talks about the hypocrites who have a disease where? Which is why literally He says, Fi qulubihim maradun. In their hearts, there's a disease. In other words, the beginning of Surah Al Baqarah over and over and over again comes back to the matter of the heart. So it is perfectly appropriate and fitting that Allah says when punishment time comes for the worst kind of disbeliever, He says about him, Allah decided to seal his heart and then his hearing. But what happens in Surah al Jathiyah is baffling. Baffling. I want you to understand in Surah al Jathiyah, we're talking about ayah number 23. 
Ayah number 23. Which means there are 22 ayat that are part of this conversation. You can say 22 statements have been made before we get to the 23rd statement. Do you remember what I said 15 sentences ago? Count them and tell me if you remember what I said 15 sentences ago. Do you remember? Do you think I remember? I don't even remember what I said 10 seconds ago. I have no idea. Last night at the dinner, they asked me to give a small talk. I have no idea what I said. I don't even know what I was saying while I was saying it. Because I was in my head I was sleeping. So now, 15 ayat ago, ayah number 8. Ayah number 8. Allah says, يَسْمَعُوا آيَاتِ اللَّهِ تُتْلَى عَلَيْهِ ثُمَّ يُصِرُّ مُسْتَكْبِرًا كَأَنْ لَمْ يَسْمَعْهَا فَبَشِّرْهُ بِعَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ He listens to the ayat of Allah, the miraculous signs of Allah, the revelations of Allah. He listens to them being recited onto him and he turns away arrogantly as though he hadn't even heard them. What crime is mentioned? The crime of a refusal to listen. Where is it mentioned? Eighth ayah. Eighth ayah. Fifteen ayat later, the Qur'an is accurate enough to recall that within this sentence, sealing the hearing should be the appropriate punishment for that kind of a person. Sealing the hearing should come first. And the heart should be mentioned second, mid-sentence. خَتَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ سَمْعِهِ وَقَلْبِهِ you, do, you think about that, like the, or, to remember what Allah said 15 sentences ago, I don't even remember, I have to look it up. I have to look it up, but Allah Azza wa Jalla's perfect speech takes into consideration what came before and what came after. It's beyond human capability. It is absolutely beyond human capability. You know, this solves a lot of problems for Hufaz of the Qur'an. Because Hufaz of the Qur'an, I compare them to trains that sometimes go on the wrong track. You're leading taraweeh and you get to an ayah and you go from like Baqarah to An'am. You ever seen that happen? Right? So you start with Alif Lam Mim and you're like, wait, there's a lot of Alif Lam Mims, which was not going for? Oh, oh. <laughs> you know? And some people hear, Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayyul qayyum, and they're thinking, okay, okay, okay. La ta'khuduhu sinatum wa la naum. Bajj nazala alaykal kitab abil haq. Oh, what's going on here? <laughs> I'm confused. And sometimes the ayat are very similar. You know, we have a joke back in the United States. There's lots of young kids that are memorizing Quran, and they have this. They get nervous, so they recite taraweeh. They lead the taraweeh prayer very quickly. They have super speeds, sonic, supersonic speeds of reciting the Quran. The only word you hear is the last one before rukur. Because you know how when a car comes to a stop at a red light, it kind of like. Mm. So like, <laughs> <laughs> We call them the Ya'lamun Ta'lamun Hafaz. Because the only two words you hear are either Ya'lamun or Ta'lamun. Ya'lamun, Allahu Akbar. Ta'lamun, Allahu Akbar. But how will you remember which one is which? Well, this study actually helps you remember. This study helps you remember. Okay, so that's enough about sequencing, even though some juicy, well, one more. Eh, two more? God, this is hard. Okay, let me try two more. وَإِذَا رَأَوْ تِجَارَةً When they saw trade, when they saw business. This is actually an ayah, this is in the same section, uh, 6211, on page 17. وَإِذَا رَأَوْ تِجَارَةً When they saw business or trade, أَوْ لَهْوًا or entertainment, in فَضُّوا إِلَيْهَا They broke away from the group. And went towards it. وَتَرَكُوكَ قَائِمًا And they left you standing there. This is an ayah about the beginnings of the ethics of the Friday prayer, the Jumu'ah. There were some Sahaba who were sitting listening to the khutbah. They don't know that it's part of the salah. They're thinking salah actually begins when aqimis salah happens. And you know, the, 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 the economy there is tough. Like the Arab economy of the time was very tough. So if you have a trade caravan or like a, you know, you can call it a convention nowadays and it's coming into town, those conventions, they stay forever or temporarily? They stay temporarily and they're on the move. This is like a moving road show, road caravan type of thing. 
So they see a caravan go by with a lot of business opportunity, a bazaar, people are selling stuff right off of their camels, etc., etc. So they see this and they're like, wait, they're not gonna, they're gonna leave town. I, I really needed to buy something. So I think I can be back in time for Salat. So they're sitting in the middle of the khutbah, they see it and they run off and they go shopping and they try to come back. And the ayah comes down when they saw business or they saw some entertainment, they broke away and ran towards it and they left you standing there. Right? This was the, Allah teaching us not to leave what? The khutbah of Jumu'ah. Right? So Allah says, قُلْ مَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ مِنَ اللَّهْوِ وَمِنَ التجارة. The change of sequence happens within the ayah itself. Allah says, well, tell them whatever Allah has is better than entertainment and better than business. Listen, listen, listen. The beginning of the ayah was when they saw business or entertainment. When they saw business or entertainment. By the end of the same ayah, what's he saying? When, that whatever Allah has is better than entertainment and better than business. So there's a switch. Why was business first in the beginning and why is business last at the end? What in the world is going on here? You see, Allah Azza wa in this ayah is teaching us a very profound lesson. And the, the literature of the Qur'an is sensitive to this. There is a specific context and there is a universal lesson. I'll say that again. There is a specific context a specific story, and from it you get a universal lesson. This happens in the Qur'an all the time. So Allah will start with something specific, and then He will draw from it a universal lesson. Min al khas il al am, From the specific to the universal. Okay? Now, what is the specific story that the ayah is talking about? In that specific story, what happened? A trade caravan came by. It was distracting the people who were sitting in the khutbah. Some of them are obviously business people. They see a business deal. So they say, I better go make that business deal because I don't know if I'll get a chance to do it again. So they go for the purpose of business. Now by the way, when you have a convention or a conference or a trade show or something like that, most of the people there, or a lot of people there, are there because of business. They're going to make business deals and network and talk to other traders and partners. And you know, that's why they go there for. But a lot of people go to the same trade show, why? Because it's going to be fun. There's a technology expo you want to go. There's a car show you want to go. So a lot of people go there for business and a lot of people go there for what? Entertainment. Now the thing is, imagine there's a discussion, there's a business fair or something. And it's out in the open in a park. A lot of people got together for business. But when you're walking by and you're a college student, which means you're useless, uh, <laughs> You're, you're walking by and you see a large crowd standing by there and there's some balloons there and a trade fair there. What are you going to do? Hey, it looks like fun. I should go check it out. In other words, you didn't go for business. You went for what? You went for entertainment. The primary reason to be attracted to that sort of thing is business. But secondarily, some people get up because it's entertaining. This is actually a phenomenon in social psychology. For instance, if there was something happening out there and it looked like, you know, it's colorful or balloons or something, one person got up because they sell balloons, the other said, hey, I see balloons, let me check it out. And so some other people get up and go because they think it might be fun. You understand? So one person went for a real reason, like a business reason, a lot of people go just for fun, just to check it out. That sort of thing, okay? That's what the story is about. But then, but then, uh, and before I go to the universal, this was the specific. I want you to understand the specific one last time. The primary reason for getting up was not entertainment. The primary reason for getting up was business. Secondarily, some people got curious and they went for the purposes of entertainment. That's the idea here. Okay. Now Allah is saying, قُلْ مَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ مِنَ اللَّهُ وَمِنَ التجارة. Let them know that whatever Allah has is better than entertainment and better than business. So he then, Allah says, what I have, what Allah has is better than entertainment first. He didn't mention business first, he attacked entertainment first. Why? He attacked entertainment first because in that particular story, the culprit was business. But the vast majority of the times for human beings, what will take them away from the remembrance of Allah? Will it be business or will it be entertainment? It'll be entertainment. In other words, even the businessmen will be struck by entertainment. Not everybody will be involved in business, but everybody will get pulled into entertainment. So Allah says, listen, look out for the real culprit here. The real culprit's gonna be entertainment. And by the way, business also. Sometimes your business can take you away from the real remembrance of Allah. So watch out for that too. So the transition happened to teach us the universal lesson. خَيْرٌ مِنَ اللَّهُوِ وَمِنَ التِّجَارَةِ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرٌ Okay, now I'm gonna move along.
Next section. I will not talk to you exhaustively about this section. I will only say one or two things about this section because for this section really to be appreciated, you have to be students of Arabic grammar. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. So we're not going to do that. But at least I'll give you some idea, okay? I'll try to make it as easy as I possibly can. Uh, because I was, my Islam, my own Islam was developed and cultivated in the United States and I was exposed to lots of different kinds of groups and scholars and you know, ideologies and things like that and even a lot of anti-Islamic literature even when I was going into college. Even as I was studying the Arabic language back in the day, uh, in the 1800s, I was, uh, I used to get, I used to get, you know, uh, GeoCities web pages, you don't even know what that is. Uh, about like, you know, contradictions in the Qur'an or grammatical mistakes in the Qur'an and things like that and evangelicals were writing against the Qur'an and talking about how there are so many mistakes in it or contradictions in it and there were academics that were writing there was, I remember still in 1996 I think it was uh, the, uh, there's some Arabic students because Georgetown University has a PhD in Arabic program right, and the, their students, uh, the master's students put together a surah like the Qur'an says bring a surah like it so they put together a surah, it was called Suratul Muslim uh, and they put it together and it looked like a page of the Mus'haf, it had like the nice calligraphy and the Uthmani font and everything and it was just a piece of trash. But they put it up on their web page like this is our class project. You know how you have a class project? Their class project was to put together a surah and it got viral back in the day. Like everybody was like, <gasps> Georgetown produced a surah. Allah said bring a surah like it and they finally did it in the University of Georgetown. You know, and people are emailing it to each other like oh my god it's ha finally happened. It's all over. Now, and then the other interesting thing that happened was a lot of uh, students, a lot of uh, professors actually, studied Arabic not in the Arab world, but they actually studied Arabic at the Western American universities, British universities, etc. And then wrote criticisms of the Qur'an from a language perspective. Like the Qur'an has grammatical errors and mistakes. And they wrote theses on this, like PhD papers were written on this stuff. Okay. Uh, out of the United States. And, and then these papers, because you know, who reads PhD papers? I don't think you do in your spare time. So, like, people don't read this stuff. But because, you know, post 9-11, there was a new industry. It's a, a very lucrative, very money-making industry. The is attack Islam industry. Right? It, it actually makes a lot of money. Without a joke, it makes a lot of money. It's serious money. Like, if you want to attack Islam and make a, write a book on it, then you can become a millionaire very quickly in America, very, very quickly. It's, it's died down now, but back in the day, it was, it's not, they don't hate Islam, let me tell you, they don't hate Islam, they just love money. <laughs> it's, uh, you need to understand what's really going on, okay? They just really, really love money. So they started taking those PhD papers, and they started pulling things out of there, and writing books on how the Quran has mistakes. And then this YouTube video started coming out about these mistakes in the Qur'an. And you know, Facebook pages started getting created. And blogs started getting created. And email chains started getting created. And this stuff is like all over now, right? So it's like, oh, you, watch, you find a YouTube video. You know, if you watch this YouTube video, you'll no longer be Muslim. You'll have like millions of hits on these videos. Because some stupid teenager sitting somewhere in Pakistan, well, not Pakistan, because YouTube is banned, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, and he'll like, oh yeah, I can watch and I'll still be Muslim, watch. <laughs> and he watches it and then he goes, oh, I don't know about this stuff. Why? Because f first of all, we're ignorant as an Ummah to get, unfortunately, ourselves. So people can take easy advantage of our ignorance. We're easy to take advantage of because of our ignorance, right? But anyway, so I read some of these papers on the mistakes or the alleged mistakes in the Qur'an and when I, as I was studying Quranic Arabic, I just found it some of the best comedy I have ever read in my life. I mean, it was fun, funny material. Because what happens, let me tell you where this comes from. In the beginning of my uh, program yesterday, uh, I, I told you there are three kinds of Arabic. Do you remember? What were they? Spoken, formal, and old Arabic, right? Quran is in? Old Arabic, which is far more refined, far more technical, far more advanced than which one? Formal. These university professors actually don't study classical Arabic, they only study formal Arabic. And they feel very confident that they actually know Old Arabic. Then they decide that they're going to learn the 10 rules of grammar that they know from formal Arabic and try to analyze the Quran that is made up of over 200 rules of, of grammar, maybe even thousands of rules of grammar.